One of the most common misconceptions is that complex phenomena arise from complex rules. In reality, the more rules a system has, the more constrained it is. Emergent behaviors often well emerge from simple, discrete rules that have seemingly nothing to do with them. Like chess and go, sometimes complexity can hide in the most unexpected places. I'm Alan Zucon, and in this short documentary, we will get lost in the endless complexity of a game so apparently simple that its creator called it life. That's a good intro. This is a good intro. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. You know, I, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, just this entire concept of complexity versus simplicity, uh, and especially in your programming languages. It's why I've been really just enjoying building actual tools in Go as of recent. The tools I'm building aren't very, very complex, but just using something as simple as HTMX and Go lately, again, HTMX and Go referenced, boom, let's go. Um, it's also just made me realize that sometimes simplicity is a pain in the ass. But often, it's really simple. It can make a lot of problems simple, some problems hard. And I'm not really sure if, if the trade-off is worth the other side yet. Is complexity in a language or complexity in a system, say React or, or Svelte or, or Solid, is the trade-off worth it? Is a little, I, I know it's not talking about programming languages, but just this concept of, of complexity, simplicity, and simplicity can lead to complexity, and just the general idea, right? I'm just kind of pondering it. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about it a lot because at the end of the day, you have to spend your life doing something. And so, which one is going to allow you to do it most effectively with the least amount of just kind of like, you know, of just maintenance nightmare? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't believe in DX. I don't believe in all these things that people keep talking about, how there's, there actually is some easy system. That's why I don't need to keep abstracting, because I don't think you're going to make the system any easier. The more you hide complexity, you're just adding more lines of code, and you're just adding new complexity, right? That's all you're doing. You're just adding new complexity. I believe in DMX. Arr! You know what I mean? And so... I've just been thinking about it a lot. Anyways, this is good. I'm excited for this. The reason why I mentioned HTMX is because I built Conway's Game of Life using uh, just JavaScript and then saving the states to a database using just like HTMX little hooks for post and delete and all that. And so that's why I mentioned it. I just, you know, Conway's Game of Life. It was, a, it was the perfect example of can you make a highly interactive application with HTMX? You can. Written by Martin Gardner called Mathematical Games. In the October 1970 issue of Scientific American, Gardner talked about the fantastic combination of this new solitaire game called Life. That was going to become one of his most successful columns. <laughs> solitaire. Like Chess and Go, Life yeah. is played with pieces on a board, but unlike Chess and Go, it requires no players. A zero-player game with no winners or losers, which result is fully determined by the initial configuration of the pieces on the board. A player is only needed to advance the state of the game to the next turn, a generation, following three simple rules. One, survival. Yep. Every piece surrounded by two or three other pieces survives for the next turn. Yeah. Two, death. Each piece surrounded by four or more pieces dies from overpopulation. Sad. Likewise, every piece next to one or no pieces at all dies from isolation. <laughs> three. Arch programmers are currently in shambles right now. You're telling me that to play the game of life, you have to be able to interact with other people? Yeah, real game of life. You're going to have to be around more than zero to one people. You're going to actually have to, you know, you're going to have to interact with real life or you die. You saw that. You die. Each square adjacent to exactly three pieces give birth to Ooh, a piece. That's a strange rule. The I knew the rule, but it's still bizarre game kind of was John Horton bizarre. Conway, a brilliant British mathematician fascinated by the exploration of mathematics in its purest form, the recreational one. Conway had carefully designed the rules behind his game of life, with the intent of making its evolution unpredictable. The idea was to find a simple set of rules which allowed the merger of two seemingly disconnected fields, engineering and biology. Some 30 years prior to Conway's <laughs> game for of the life, fact, Stanislav Ulam and John von Neumann explored the theory behind self-replicating. I always have this question, okay? I always have this question, which is, what life do you live in which you can invent Conway's game of life? Like what? What kind of life setup do you have to have where you're just like, I'm gonna, ex I'm going to explore this? Like you're writing it down on pieces of paper, you know? I mean, it's super cool. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm super, I think it's super cool. It, I just don't, you know, you know what I'm trying to say here? Like I, I don't have time for that. I got like a wife and kids. Like if my wife came and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, ah, 
I'm working on this really cool mathematical game. I've been thinking about it for years. She'd be like, what the hell are you doing? You will go and play with the kids. Uh, a single and wealthy is that you have to be a sink. No job, bored and alone. Okay, okay. Sink is a single, single income, no kids. Dink being double income, no kids. He was a professor. Ah, yes, classic university professor. Where the bastion of free society go? They modeled them using two-dimensional grids, updated in discrete steps, following precise and deterministic rules. Yeah, okay. They called them cellular automata. Oh yeah. That was so satisfying. In scientific America. I will say that the sound of a pencil on like paper plus something hard behind it, that was so good. It's just so good. It's so good. It feels good. Life got so popular among mathematicians that a quarterly newsletter called Lifeline started appearing. Wow. It is in there that its editor, Robin Wainwright, published a system to classify the many objects, patterns as they called, that is so appearing in the game. Class one are the so-called still lifes, patterns that do not change over time. Oh Class wow, two still lifes. are called oscillators, and they repeat oh, cool. over a certain number of generations. They are classified based on their period. Wow. And Blinker, for instance, repeats after two generations, <laughs> hence it has period two. <laughs> it's, just, it's so funny to me. Uh, people saw this, and then a newsletter goes out, and they start classifying all this behavior. Well, I just want to see the shooter. How do they make the shooters? I like the one that shoots. How cool is that? Many believe that oscillators of any period can be constructed in life, and indeed, oh yeah, glider guns. Let's go. To exist for all periods except 19, 38, and 41. Class three groups some of the most studied patterns: spaceships. Those are oscillators that, at the end of the cycle, somehow find themselves in a different position. They effectively move. The most well-known and loved is, without any doubt, the glider. Discovered in 1969 by the British mathematician Richard Kenneth Guy, it was named by John Conway himself due to a property that exhibits called <laughs> glide symmetry. Gliders are the smallest spaceship known to exist, and yet they play a fundamental role for all mathematicians and computer scientists interested in studying life from a more academic point of view. A major breakthrough occurred in 1970 when Conway himself offered $50 to the first who could find a configuration which grew indefinitely. The American mathematician and programmer Neil Gosper responded with what is now known as the Gosper glider gun, an oscillator that every 30 generations spawns a new glider. That was the first class 4 object to be discovered. <laughs> class 5 patterns behave seemingly erratically, chaotic as we would say today, until they eventually collapse to one of the aforementioned classes. But some patterns are doomed to a different fate, remaining in a perpetual state of chaos, forever evolving yet, never stabilizing onto something predictable. This is the mysterious squirters classics. Life. It is. This is always so shocking to me that you know, given any sufficiently uh, sufficiently complicated system, right? I know life's rules are really simple, but what it produces is fairly complex. But no matter like, no matter how useless a complicated system is there will always be somebody who is an expert in it. Class 5, Battlecruiser. As long as that has a Yokomoto laser gun on it. That's all I want. Um, it's just funny how it's, it, I mean, to me, it just, it shocks me that these things do exist. Right? That you just get a complex enough, dude, it just, just somebody will be attached to it. And someone will, like, classify it. It's wild that this classification's really good. Considering that 5 and 6 are, like, the, the, the precursors to those four, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's really well, like proc macros. They're proc macros. ...and remains a fully deterministic game with clear rules and no randomness of any kind. Yet, generally speaking, the fate of a pattern cannot be predicted without simulating it directly. One could okay. simply wait until a pattern eventually falls into a stable configuration. But if it does not, if it truly belongs to class six, then you would wait forever for an answer which will never come. The game of life is ultimately undecidable. There are many patterns whose fate is easy to predict, but in general, this cannot be done for an arbitrary pattern. That might sound like a bold statement, but if we want to understand why, we need to go deeper. Uh, let's Hold go on deeper. Tight to your glider, because we're about to build a computer in life. I've been holding tight on my glider for a while now. Logic gates. <laughs> the first step to creating a computer is, well... I really want to have a picture of me like that. I want a bookshelf in disarray while holding some complex sticking ball thing dude that photo is amazing that photo is amazing 
That photo is amazing. I want that photo. The man's a legend. I want it in black and white. ...to understand how computers work in the first place. The uh, component Windows that actually triggered. performs the computation, the processor, takes electrical triggered. signals and combines them using special circuits called logic gates. They can C perform drive? very simple mathematical operations using only two values, zero and one. Oh, there's More than a little glider. Components and code those zeros and ones Look at that little using glider two go. different voltages, such as zero and five volts. But here in life, we need to think creatively. We need something that can travel the grid carrying information with it and that can be easily created and destroyed. Gliders satisfy all of these properties and are therefore the perfect candidates to be used as signal carriers. Okay. A new glider can be created every 30 generations using a gospel gun. So, finding one at a specific location every 30 generations means that we have received a pulse, a single bit of information. And if we do not receive a glider every 30 generations, that counts as receiving a zero. We can imagine a traveling glider as a single bit of information moving along an invisible wire. These allows encoding any binary signal let's go okay i'm liking as a series this of gliders. and all of the binary operations that one can imagine between those sequences can actually be implemented using just three very simple logic gates not and and oh all. you guys can't even see it's the counting. simplest logic gates that we can construct is a not gate it takes a signal oh, and it inverts its state in life so the empty spaces using are zeros just three very simple logic gates not and and or that makes sense the simplest logic so those gates things that being we can sent out at a consistent rate it takes a signal and it inverts it's kind of exciting state. hey polar mutex in life, this means constructing a pattern that will do two things we are creating the most inefficient computer ever yes and stopping any incoming gliders from traveling any further it is pretty clear that for the former we need a gospel gun since the not gate has to generate a stream of gliders when nothing is being received. A gospel gun. Okay. We can exploit another important property of gliders. If two of them collide in just the right way, they annihilate each other. We can carefully place the gospel gun so that it is blocked by the input stream. When a glider arrives, it will stop the output stream. And when no gliders are received, the stream will carry on undisturbed. An end gate takes two inputs, hence two streams, and produces a new glider on I just want to make sure, like, at the end of this video, if we don't produce Doom, I'm just going to be genuinely disappointed, okay? If this does not end with Doom, I am so upset. Only when you receive two at the same time. You I can expect construct it. such a pattern by modifying and extending an existing knot gate. How do they even get to this point? Well, in these constructions, this is a class we can use the glider stream generated rookie. from gun A as the output for our logic gate. If A is off, the output stream will be off as well, regardless of the state of B. The gun on the right is then placed in such a way that its glider stream will annihilate any glider coming from A. In order for the signal A to survive, the gliders from B must block the incoming stream. This means that only when both A and B are switched on, a glider stream can travel any further. This is indeed an end gate. When both input signals are off, the stream from the gospel gun would eventually travel outside the gate. To stop it from propagating too far, we can add a special pattern called a glider eater that, well, eats an incoming glider. The last gate we will construct is an OR gate. As the name suggests, it produces a glider when it receives at least one from its two input streams. Once again, these can be constructed by modifying an existing end gate. The idea is to use the input stream to block a gospel gun, which would have otherwise blocked the output stream. What makes the NOT and an OR gate so fundamental is that they are a functionally complete set of logic gates. It means that they can be chained together to compute the results of any arbitrarily complex binary expression. But will that be enough to build a computer? Well, the answer is no, as the information, the glider streams, only flow... Okay, so the thing that I, I really am hoping to see is that somehow you can programmatically create these little gliders. Like, if you can create these little gliders programmatically, somehow. I'm not sure how you'd, you'd, you'd encode information into Conway's Game of Life. It, but if you can, you know what happens, right? We got Doom. Like, it's right around the corner. Pre-watched? No! I'm an engineer, damn Stop it! I'm an engineer, damn it! Like, this is what I want to see. This is where it's at. I'm, all I want. It's on GitHub already. Shut up! Stop rooting it. 
This all makes sense, though. For those that Who's don't understand what's happening here, it's very, very simple. Obviously, here's the input stream right here coming in, right? Here is B. If B hits one of these, that means B's on in some sense. If A hits one of them, it's on. If they're both, if they're both on, then A should never, uh, A should not be terminated. So thus, A continues on. So if you don't understand what's happening here, it's pretty like a pretty simple logic gate. If this thing gets all the way through, then obviously, uh, A and B are both not on. If just B's on, then A will never go. If just A's on then A will never go through and make it. So it's like they, they both have to be on for the little, little guys to come through. It's kind of neat, right? From the top to the bottom. What makes computers, well, computers? Yeah, they have essentially to change. The ability. Yeah. That's the, so that's the confusing part is how do they prepare? How do, because you have to travel in real time. So how do you, I mean, is it really any different than anything else? I don't know. But how do you send out a signal and time it? The timing seems really confusing. To reuse their previous outputs as inputs. But, luckily for us, an entire group of patterns called reflectors allows just that. When a glider hits a reflector, it bounces off in a different direction. This really allows us to rate a record glider stream pretty much wherever we want, oh, and even no. to use the result of a logic gate as its input. Now, we really do have everything we need <laughs> to build a computer, oh, starting no. from one of its most basic components, memory blocks. One of the simplest form of memory storage in modern electronics is a latch. Latches are simple circuits that can store a single bit, either 0 or 1, and which have two inputs called set and reset. They are used to set the memory to 1 and to reset it back to 0, respectively. Intuitively, you can imagine latches as switches that once pressed remember the state in which they are, even when you stop pressing them. A very simple set-reset latch can be constructed in life using just four gates, although a very simple set relatch. Set reset latch can be constructed using four gates. This is a very simple one, by the way. This is very simple. This is actually super cool because, I mean, if you ignore the craziness of these, like, a little glider gun generators, whatever they call them, these class four items, if you can ignore that and try to just comprehend what's going on here, it seems like it is, uh, it seems like this is a good way to, like, learn how things kind of work here. This is how they built Java? Well, that would make you for a silk. pretty bulky assembly. Luckily for us, there is a rather inexpensive pattern that can do exactly the same in a much smaller space. Ooh. It uses two gospe guns pointing at each other. When a single glider hits a gun in just the right way, it introduces a momentarily delay in its flow. This causes an offset in the glider stream that the gun produces, which changes the dynamic of the collision. This indeed works as a switch. I wanted to see the other side hit it and turn it off. HTML5 supercomputers looking thick right now. This is, what? Dude, how do you take the time to figure, I just, I mean, I know this is impressive. This is genuinely the most impressive thing I've seen in a long time. Showing the logic gates and memory blocks can be built in a system <laughs> is basically enough to prove that, at least in theory, we can build a proper computer in it. These oh. systems are said to be Turing complete, after the English mathematician Alan I can't Turing, look at Minecraft. Pretty Minecraft much came makes up with me so theory sick. I don't know why computers. it's Minecraft. Only Minecraft As it makes turns me out, sick. It's the only video game I can't play. Pretty much like life does. Allow players to build also, structures the screen that can evolve. Does not help are Turing complete. This is but <laughs> tell me you're an arch user. Without telling me you're an arch user. It's the field of view. I literally have absolute I've never been sick from a single video game in my entire lifetime. Except for Minecraft. Minecraft, Infinity Factory, Prison Architect, City Skylines, Baba Is You are all unintentionally Turing complete. And many players, myself included, enjoy the challenge of building actual computers in them. That's kind of fun. No matter how small, slow, or limited those in-game contraptions are, they could nonetheless solve the same class of problems that even the most powerful computers can. Being Turing complete is not measured in gigabytes or teraflops, but in which class of problems you can solve. And no matter how powerful a Turing machine is, there are indeed problems that it cannot solve. Many of those undecidable problems exist, with the most famous being the Altium problem, deciding whether or not a given program will eventually terminate. These should sound very familiar. If there are programs whose evolution cannot be predicted, and if those very same programs could be encoded in life, then it follows that there must be patterns whose evolution cannot be predicted. The mysterious, elusive class 6. How do we know that building a computer in life is technically possible, 
it would be rather anticlimactic to end the video without showing an actual computer yep. built in life. Yep. In April 2000, Paul Randall created the first fully functioning computer in the form of a Turing machine. A construct whose architecture was devised by Alan Turing himself and which often serves as the base to study computers in a more abstract and mathematical sense. Okay. Randall's Turing machine takes 11,040 generations to complete one cycle. <laughs> And the one you see here computes a simple finite state machine with three states. So what you're trying to say, just, just so I understand this correctly, you're trying to say that this thing still runs faster than anything on Web3. It's more power efficient than Web3. We should just, we should just consider using Conway's Game of Life for Web3 instead, because, I mean, that sounds pretty efficient at this point. Randall later released two improved versions of his design, including a full universal Turing machine. A Turing machine was programmed is running another Turing machine. An even bigger result was achieved by Nicola Loiseau in 2016, when he crafted an 8-bit programmable computer. Compared to a Turing machine, this is without any doubt a computer in its modern form. It supports 8 variables and 13 instructions. What makes this endeavor even more surprising is the fact that Loiseau crafted his pattern starting from only 4 basic patterns, a period 60 glider gun, that was, a 90 degree glider reflect. For whatever reason, seeing a large system all work together, there's something so satisfying about it. Isn't it strange to just watching something like that? It just, it just feels so good. It just, it, I, you know, even if I'm too stupid, I'm too stupid to understand, it doesn't matter. It feels good. The, a glider duplicator. I never tried playing meter. Factorio. Once they were used to create... No. I have a general rule of thumb, which is if I play video games, I play video games to escape reality. Okay? So I want to play Apex. I want to play Fortnite. I want to play uh, Elden Ring. Love Elden Ring. I want to play things that just help me escape reality. Right? That's why I, I really love playing video games. And so I cannot possibly play a video game that is Factorio. I can't go back to work for my casual time, okay? Like I, I just can't. I test the I test I test my brain all day every day. I just need I need a little bit I just need my, my own personal time. Okay. My own personal time. By the way, uh, I think November third likely. November third, I will be doing a twenty four hour stream, charity, extra life, and it will involve some video games. So you hate your job? No, and, I just don't want to do it all the time. Gates, he was able to assemble all the necessary circuitry to create basic components for his computer, namely oh, set reset so latches, which he used to create memory blocks, and others used to build an arithmetic and logic unit capable of performing simple operations on binary numbers. Okay, I'll look, at, in case that, you're look at how satisfying that is. His computer is currently busy calculating numbers from the Fibonacci series. Many more people contributed to the creation of some rather outstanding contraptions in life, such as this digital clock, which come with its own four-digit display. But perhaps, one of the most intriguing aspects of being Turing complete is not really the fact that you could build a computer in life. That is so It is the fact that you can simulate beautiful. life within life itself. Oh yeah, oh yeah, give me the reveal. Give me the reveal. Give it to me. Oh, it's speeding it up. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Cycles are going out of control. Look at all those gates. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, oh, uh, oh, oh, struggle, struggling. We're struggling. Oh, I can know. Oh. Are we supposed to be scared? I think we're supposed to have an erection right now because that's what's currently happening. Oh my goodness, I almost just threw up. I see what's happening now. Oh my goodness. Look at it. Oh no way. No. 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 No, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> oh man, there better be doom. I hope there's doom. Come with Game of Life is undoubtedly one of the most successful of several automata ever discovered. 
Some might undoubtedly struggle to understand how a simulation that requires, well, no players could even be described as a game. How many years did it take, dude? It took so long. Pretty much like any other product would. Like, dude, clearly we are in a cellular, cellular automata life simulation right now. That, okay, that, maybe it was all worth it. Maybe I, that alone has potentially restored my faith in useless research. Both of the title is a game because for decades it has been capturing the attention of millions Haskell, of people. also useless 50 research. years after its original publication, thousands are still not just playing it, but conducting actual research on it. As it turns out, life is more than just a game. Conway's achievement was not just discovering what is possibly the most interesting cellular automaton, but also to make this entire new field appealing to a much larger audience. On 11th of April 2020, John Houghton Conway died of complication from COVID-19. He was 82 years old, and many remember him as one of the most charismatic mathematicians of his time. In the words of his biographer, Siobhan Roberts, John Houghton Conway is perhaps the most lovable egomaniac. He is Archimedes, Nick Jagger, Salvador Dali, and Richard Feynman, all rolled into one. He is one of the greatest living mathematicians, with a sly sense of humor, a polymath promiscuous curiosity, and a compulsion to explain everything about the world to everyone in it. According to Sir Michael Etier, former president of the Royal Society and arbiter of mathematical fashion, Conway is the most magical mathematician in the world. And as the most magical mathematician... That's a pretty... That's pretty big. That's a pretty big comp compliment right there. The, the most magical mathematician in the world. Yeah, poor uh, dude. It sucks. <sighs> sucks that he's out. But incredible. I mean, I, I much shocked at world, how much more person can build as his life lives on. Alan, great video. Absolutely loved it. Uh, man, sometimes you know when I see these things like. I hope what this really gives you at the end of the day, I hope when you watch a video like this, what it, it doesn't just give you this feeling of like, wow, people are super smart and I'm super stupid. <laughs> st st Steve! Um, I think the thing that it should give you is that everything in life, everything in programming, everything that you see can be built from these really simple pieces. And that all you have to do is learn the simple pieces, right? So even if you don't end up learning these simple pieces, you don't end up doing all that, don't get imposter syndrome from these kind of videos. Just realize that things are simpler than you've probably made them in your head, and that if you ever wanted to learn them, you could, right? Like, like, a, like a logic gate is not hard. A logic gate, like an and logic gate, is four states. You could learn that. You, have, you already know them because you do if statements, right? And so just like learning the gates. And then after you learn the gates, maybe you have to do a little bit of car not maps. You have to do a little bit extra and then, you know, put a few together and you could make something learning. How, I used to know how to do a transition or a transistor at one point. You could put them all together. You know, you can just do each one of them slowly over time. It's just like anything is learnable, right? And I think a lot of times people just have this, there's just this general fear to learn something that you don't understand. Anyways, it's just something to think about is that Things aren't as confusing. And so I know a lot of you, a lot of you that watch these videos, uh, watch my videos, are people that are just like, all you know is Next.js and React, right? I know there's a lot of you like that, and you're just trying to figure out the whole world of programming and everything. Loser, okay, big loser. Wait, loser. Uh, but with that in, like, in mind, in, in thought, just remember that Next.js, React, like all these things, they're not that confusing. And what I mean is that if you were to try to understand, say, how page-based routing works, it's really not that hard. I bet you could build it a few weeks, right? Like you could actually figure out how that works pretty quickly. And then you could keep on going and going and going, and you could actually get smarter. And you realize how simple these things really are. Like what you use is just pretty straightforward, right? Everyone has skill issues. File-based routing, not page-based routing. Yeah, file-based routing, whatever you call it. It's actually like all these things aren't that hard. And then you can start seeing why they make these decisions. And then you become a better engineer. And then you're the engineer people go to because you took the time to understand how something works a bit underneath. Yeah, I know. I saw some video saying caching is simple. I just have a hard time believing it or even watching it. Anyways, like right now at my job, I'm helping to, I'm helping. I'm not the primary person on this one, but I'm helping rewrite some of the internals of Re React to be faster and more memory efficient. And I don't know. 
Did I know anything about how React works before this? No. Did I have any of the terminology about how React works internally? No. Have I ever looked at a VDOM ever in my lifetime? No. Was I able to help out? Yes. I made a, I got to, the first thing I did was to add a little sweet algorithm, uh, the Kruskal's algorithm, uh, the path compression part of it. I was able to add to help uh, efficient lookup of child positioning. It was fun. It was awesome. Absolutely loved doing it. And now there's a lot more I get to do. Today, I get to look about, uh, you know, reactive context, as we call it, which is just being able to kind of understand the state of where everything is as it renders, right? And how to make that smoother, faster, nicer. You hate React and you work, uh, work to optimize it. <laughs> life, is, uh, life is art, but unknown to thee. <laughs> That's really what it is. Um, the name. is I really don't like React, okay? Stop. Okay, I don't. I don't like React, okay? I think SolidJS is better, just intrinsically. But hey, man, I'll still try to make it fastogen. Blazingly fast. 